Hi everyone, my name is Sam and thanks for checking out this video. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below, hit the bell notification, and give the video a thumbs up. I want to talk about the books that I read this week and actually read quite a bit. So the first thing that I read this week was a reread of Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. I'm not going to delve too much into this because I've done a review on it before on my channel and I'm doing my Tuesday video as a book versus movie thing so you'll hear a bit more about it there. In case you live under a rock and don't know what this is, <laughs> it's an adult contemporary chiclet book where our main character Rachel Chu is an economics professor in New York and has been dating her boyfriend for about two years. For the summer they are going back to Singapore, his home country, where uh, he is supposed to set to be a best man for his best friend's wedding and he wants to introduce his girlfriend and they find out, well, they, Rachel finds out he's a bajillionaire and drama ensues. Five out of five stars again, absolutely love this book. The next book that I read was actually not on my TBR for the month, but I, it was gonna be and then I took it out and then I decided, no, I do want to read it this month. So I finally, finally, the book came out like a month ago, <laughs> finally read Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is the first book in a new series, The Sixth world yes the sixth world series so it's kind of like a dystopian kind of zombie paranormal -y kind of vibe so this book is set in a world after like climate change has like wiped out most of the population it's not habitable there's been like plagues and outbreaks so there's fairly limited like pockets of actual life and so there's a lot of just like rebellions like just like random like crooks and all this weird as you would imagine in this sort of a situation so we follow our main character who lives in or around the Navajo Reserve in the southern United States and that is one of kind of the safe zones that is still like habitable and she has a troubled past and it kind of explores a little bit of that of everything she's gone through before this book but she essentially like travels to find and kill all of these like ghost zombie things that when they bite people they like take over it's like an infection kind of like a zombie thing so obviously you want to stop that but she's also got this whole passing that keeps coming up and one of her local sort of elder figures offers her some help in all these questing that she does and it is his nephew i believe and he has some powers which are also developed in this book so they do a lot of like questing adventuring within like a reasonable geographic distance but there's lots of like I want to say I read somewhere that the author is part African-American part indigenous and lives in New Mexico so I you could definitely feel those influences however I know sometimes when people read books with a lot of indigenous cultures it just feels very just spiritual so that was where I was kind of like I'm curious how she's going to make this kind of into dystopian but there really are these elements there's the trickster and that was the one that really really popped my eye because even though I live in northern Alberta that is one of the few things that seems to be pretty consistent in indigenous cultures no matter where you go they all have different languages and colors and you know arts and crafts and beading procedures and, and designs but a lot of them have this trickster element in their spiritual background so it's just so so interesting to see that incorporated I absolutely loved it the main character was flawed and not perfect and I loved that she was really really interesting I loved getting to read from her point of view she also you like she just she's clearly wanting to be a good person but it's so hard in this world to try and make decisions that you know helps the the general people but also you have to in this dystopian world like fight for yourself so it's just really really interesting I loved the characters there's big betrayal at the end which was so good I'm definitely gonna pick up the sequels I, I really really love this I blew through it in a few hours I would highly highly recommend it and it was just I'm not a big dystopian reader at this point but it was just really really enjoyable dystopian then I decided to break my own heart and read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid yes that's a long name Oh dear lord, this is an ugly cry book and if you've seen my vlog then you know what I am talking about. It hurt my soul and my heart. I I think I read this literally all both this and Trail of Lightning on the same day and I just went to bed just like mascara streaming down my face and like it just hurt. It just hurt. So I mean the title's pretty self-explanatory but it follows 
like kind of two points of views. It's kind of current time where we have a reporter who's been chosen by this massive Hollywood star. She's an unknown reporter and the Hollywood star is Evelyn Hugo and she wants to give her biography. She's normally super, super private, doesn't talk to the general public. Everyone just knows that she had this big Hollywood career for a while in like the 70s and 80s and she was married seven times. And so she, for some reason, wants to give her life story to this reporter to be published. And so then we flip to Evelyn telling the story and it goes through the seven husbands, but it, that's not, that's not the point, I guess. I don't know how to say that, but the big thing is she's a closeted bisexual woman in the seventies and eighties. And one of her partners is a closeted lesbian and remembering this is the seventies and eighties. They would have lost their careers if this stuff had come out and that's all I really want to say without spoiling it. It's heartbreaking in the end. Like it comes full circle as well. I was nearing the end. I was like, I still don't understand why she picked this random unknown reporter. Everything comes full circle. Be prepared to cry. It did not pull like a refugee Alan Gratz crying on me, but it was close, man. And it's, it's just really interesting and captivating, I think, like this woman's life and everything she went through. And it brings up a lot of different topics, especially of like sexism and the role that like women had to get married and the weirdness of Hollywood with whitewashing things and women's ages. And it's just so incredibly interesting. The ending was tore my heart out. It was so sad. Five out of five stars. We're also reading it. It's the book of the month for the TBR and Beyond book group. Then I picked up The Magician by Michael Scott. This is the second book in the immortal life of Nicholas, Secrets of the Immortal Nicholas Flamel. That's what it's called. I think it's six books in total. But so this follows directly after the first book. The first book ends with like literally like a boom explosion and the twins are safe for now with our main character Nicholas and he is still kind of separated from his wife and there's all the magic kind of up in the air. We know from the first book that the twins are assumed to be the twins of a prophecy and the sister's powers have been like unleashed and are starting to begin to develop but her brother isn't and the brother is being kind of distantly manipulated by our evil side shall we say. So it picks up and they flee to Paris. Part of the reason being Nicholas is familiar with this place. He lived there for several decades with his wife and it's just oh, I, li I think I liked this one actually more than the first book but it was really cool we get to meet um not only like the main villain from the first book but he's also kind of like being helped out by Machiavelli and then Joan of Arc is thrown in out on the good side it was just so cool to get to see Joan of Arc fighting a gargoyle all right let's just like leave it at that but really really cool we get to see lots of different parts of Paris including the catacombs and the siblings and then their relationship with each other as well as their relationship with Nicholas Flamel is really really interesting to see how that differs because they are twins and they're just they keep mentioning the first book oh we're like the same we always have the same thing and then this is really pulling them apart they don't have identical viewpoints on a lot of this stuff so it's really really cool we get to see the powers develop and that sibling bond is really tested and I think I end up giving this book four out of five stars I'm going to keep an eye out for the third book in paperback at my bookstore then I read A Study in Scarlet Women by Sherry Thomas this is the first book and I think it's supposed to be a trilogy yeah let's say trilogy right now at least essentially this is just like a gender swap Sherlock Holmes retelling but it follows our main character in Victorian England she's disgraced from a relatively well standing family and she has left the home because her parents are just have lied to her an awful lot and the situation she's she's not comfortable growing up and staying in that situation and she doesn't want to have to get married so she leaves to strike out on her own and she actually takes on the fake personality of Sherlock Holmes and starts helping the local police deal with a bunch of like seemingly Un, in, un uninteracted unrelated murder slash suicides and so she starts helping via like letters to detective Lestrade kind of character and then we also have the female Watson figure which is brought in which was really really cool I love the full gender swap I don't think I've ever actually read that it's normally just like one of the characters is swapped and the other is left male so that they can have the romance element which I really like that they didn't do that in this. To be totally honest, it's a fun mystery. I enjoyed it. I was kind of weirded out at the end, the wrap up. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't see it going that way. Oh, all right. 
all right I guess that's good though however I don't know that I would really consider it a Sherlock Holmes retelling other than changing the the gender and keeping the names I don't feel like the characters really portrayed were portrayed with those characteristics of being like ridiculously smart like even the Sherlock character she does have a lot of more social understanding and social connections and you know public personality like interacting with people I feel like she has a lot more of those elements than the real Sherlock Holmes character did and the Watson character too it's just the name none of the personality or characteristics or like things that are distinctly Sherlock or Watson were really transferred over all that successfully to the main characters. So that was a little bit disappointing, but enjoyed it nonetheless as a, just a mystery on its own. So I think it gave us like a three and a half out of five stars. Then I whizzed through another reread of Heretics Anonymous by Katie Henry. This is the finished copy. I, I, it's been months since I read the art. If you don't know, this is one of my favorite standalones of all time, even though it's a contemporary and I don't like contemporaries. <laughs> But it follows our main character, Michael, who is in high school. His family has had to move all over the country because his father's job keeps either getting promoted or moved around. So he's not on good standing relationships with his father because his father keeps telling him this will be the last one. And then they do it again in a couple months. And then on that interesting note, he is an atheist. And then his family sends him to a Catholic school. <laughs> and I think my big connection with this book was that I was an atheist and I had to go to Catholic school myself. I remember the weird, like, kind of double standards of sexism. I remember the ridiculously ugly and uncomfortable and expensive uniforms and the plaid of them. I remember feeling very much like an outcast and trying to find that group of people who also felt that way. And I ended up finding it pretty easily. My school had like 3,000 kids, so it wasn't super difficult. So Michael starts going to school, and on his first day, he interacts with someone who calls out one of his teachers for kind of sexist double standards comments, and then he goes up to her and is like, yo, like, I didn't know that I was the only, I, I thought I was going to be the only one. Nice to meet you. I, like, I'm also an atheist. And she's like, I'm not an atheist. I'm a Catholic. So we meet this, like, like hardcore vocal feminist Catholic. We have a gay Jewish boy. We have a woman in there that is oh, I can't remember, Pagan. I remember, I think it's Norse religion, spirituality that she follows. And then it's just this group of like little lovable misfits come together and kind of just hash out the things that make them angry about the school in like a secret basement of room in the school. And then they decide, why do we just complain about this nonstop? Why do we try and actually do something? And then naturally there's this one female character in the book who is like, absolute by the book her family has I think she's one of like seven kids she's the only one that's ever not been homeschooled for high school and she wants the school to stay as like pristine and like as is as possible because her family would not let her go there if it changes so there's all these weird elements probably the funniest part is when that girl who wants everything to stay the same because they call themselves the group Heretics Anonymous that they're posting this stuff, right? And then this other girl starts trying to make a group and she puts a poster up. It was like, join the Crusades. <laughs> On top of all this plot, the main character is so sarcastic and so, so, so funny. I absolutely love the comedic tone. I think my only like kind of negative thing was I was reading this book, but I also listened to the audiobook because my library got the audiobook. I like reading all these different formats. I don't like the audiobook. The audiobook takes away a lot of the comedic tone and humor of the dialogue. So if you're looking for that, I would hesitate, kind of gear you towards just reading the physical book on its own, not listening along to the audiobook. Then, in a couple minutes really, I whipped through A Girl Called Echo, Volume 1 of The Pemmican Wars. This is the graphic novel. I think it's supposed to be a trilogy as well. It's only like 40 pages, I think. There's not a ton of dialogue in this one either, but the, the illustrations are absolutely beautiful. So it's set kind of contemporary. There's no real specific date, but our main character keeps kind of mentally transforming herself back to the 1800s in Canada when the Métis settlements were kind of being... There was, they were called the Pemmican Wars, but like the Hudson's Bay companies and all these fur trading companies and posts getting set up. And then they were trying to take away a lot of the rights of the Métis settlements. So like things like you can't make pemmican and can't hunt bison anymore. And they're like, how the heck are we supposed to feed ourselves? And then naturally these communities get wiped out, put at a ridiculous disadvantage. Then we find out at the end, she is her Métis herself. And like, she's got her, her, uh, like, um, in the designs, like she's got the Métis infinity symbol and everything on her. But it's at the end, they were like, just because you don't know this Métis history doesn't mean you're less of a Métis person. And that was a really, like, 
even though there's not a ton of dialogue, I think that's a really, really key aspect with the residential schools and multi-generational trauma that comes out of that. And then the 60s scoop, there is all of a sudden now this, since culture and our standing in the, in the last few years in Canada has really changed. Now that people are like, oh, I can actually publicly acknowledge that I'm Cree or that, you know, my great grandmother was Métis or that so like all of these things that they were supposed to hide or it was just understood that you don't talk about this. It's not a part of the family we discuss, nor do we promote. Now all these people are starting to go back and learn everything that their great grandmother's Métis background and some of them are getting status cards. But that is a big thing of like, I'm this Indigenous person. I know both my parents were First Nations, but I was taken from their home, put in foster care and adopted by this white family who, you know, they raised me. They, in many cases, they're wonderful parents to me. But how do I fit in with this other culture? And I'm definitely going to read the next volume. The illustrations are just, the colors are absolutely beautiful. So, so pretty. And last but definitely not least, I read A Touch of Gold by Annie Sullivan. This came out just a couple days ago, I think, actually. And this is the debut work by Annie, and it's a fantasy standalone, which are like unicorns. So our main character is actually Princess Korra, the daughter of King Midas. And King Midas, you, you find out a little bit of his pre-story, but, you know, he came in and just splurged all of the kingdom's gold, and now they're in dire financial situations. But we also find out that King Midas' daughter Korra has the power to essentially like, transfer gold from, like, items to other people. And... That ability has made her, and her skin is kind of gold too, so that has made her really like, no one wants to marry her, the kingdom's kind of falling apart, she's like kept under wraps, and the p kingdom is under some like political pressure. So things go crazy though when her father, like the last things keeping him alive is the proximity to a f the last few items that he had turned gold, and then those items are stolen. So she goes on this trip with a bunch of like sailors and pirates to try and find those items back. Lots of betrayal, lots of betrayal. Girl's gonna have trust issues for the rest of her life. Like, just understood. I liked the romances, like they kind of, the twists and turns kind of associated with the betrayals and the romances also were pretty, like I was surprised. I didn't really see any of them coming. They were enjoyable. I felt like the plot was pretty well, like consistent, like good pacing. The world was pretty well built for a standalone. I didn't feel like it was lacking anything with the plot associated with it. Character development was really good. I really, really bought into Princess Cora and I loved her. I would have liked, you know, maybe a little bit, a couple more chapters of a bit more of the romance because I feel like it was just added in bits and places rather than given like its own time to breathe and shine but honestly that's really my only criticism I really really enjoyed this love the retelling love the King Midas love how that she started like kind of using her p ability to to like touch gold and kill people with the gold stuff as more of like an, a weapon to defend herself rather than a reason to like hermit mode it and be like timid really really liked that overall I think I give the book like a four and a half or five out of five stars really enjoyed it highly recommend really good fantasy standalone so those are all of the books that I read this week let me know in the comment section down below if you've read any of these and what you thought I'd also love to hear just what you read this week too make sure to check the description box down below I will link all of these books to the Goodreads pages and I will link all of my social media if you follow me I will follow you 